All right, welcome to lecture six, which is week eight. <laughs> I have to keep track of weeks in my head. Um, we've now reached the halfway point of the term, technically, and then some. Um, what we're covering today is the select statement, or the beginning of the select statement. And if, there we go. So, Ah, uh, shoot, I forgot to update this slide. When I was telling you guys I s cut the slideshow in half, I forgot to update that slide. I am covering this little at the top. Uh, the select statement and distinct. Uh, why? It's because that the first two points were actually half the slideshow. Now, the select statement. Last week we covered creating, updating, and modifying tables, deleting, dropping tables, that kind of stuff, adding and deleting data. Those are the functionality that you use occasionally when you deal with a database. The statement is what you use 95% of the time, if not more. And its purpose in life is to retrieve data out of the database. In other words, you're going to select records to look at. So a bit like when you open up a filing cabinet and you select a file to pull out and look at it, the select statement allows you to select specific records out of the database. It is very, very, very flexible. Um, it, does, it does a ton of stuff. Um, you can do all kinds of things with it. Depending on you feed it, it'll output stuff differently. Uh, it can do math for you. You can get it to tell you what time it is even if you want. There's all kinds of things you can do with it. It's made up of two, three, well actually six pieces. And today I'm covering like the first three parts, pieces of it. Uh, and, but I will list them off. This is actually one of the changes I did this slideshow because in the past people always ask me, what are the different pieces? These are the pieces and these are the order they go in. In other words, when you start writing up your select statements, these are the, literally the order that the, the, the pieces of it are written in. The first piece is always select because you've got to tell the database what you want to do. If it's update, you're updating. Select means you're going to grab records. At the same time, part of the select clause of the select statement is telling it what you want returned, what fields you want back, um, that kind of stuff. From tells you the source of the data is. Normally, it's tables. Sometimes it's views and sometimes it's something called a derived table. Where is a series of conditional Boolean operations? As predicates. If this is the same thing as the concept of the NIF statement in Java, the syntax is different, the concept is the same, including brackets and all. It's in a, a NIF statement is value, operator, value, whether the value is a variable or an actual value, 1 is equal to 1 is the same thing as, as i equal to i. Doesn't make a difference. The database works the same way. And then the last three pieces, which I'm going to be covering next week, is group by. It's an optional clause. It's if you're working with aggregate functions, which is also what I'm covering next week. The having operator, which has to do with the group by, because you can't have having without group by. That's just how it works. And then order by which allows you to sort the results. So depending how long today takes, I might order by also. But I'm going to focus on the select, the from, and the where, mostly today. So the field list is straightforward and easy to understand. You have two options. You either use an asterisk, which means grab all available columns, and it grabs every column that's available, or a defined list separated by commas. And in theory, you can actually mix match the asterisks and a list of fields, but usually that's kind of pointless if you're going to do that. Because then you're defeat, why would you list off the fields if you're grabbing everything anyways? So it would look like select star. We all often hear people say select star, it's select asterisk, but people like calling it select star, which means give me everything. Or you could go select ID comma name or select ID comma order date or you know name comma email address. Such so as the list of fields you want to return. Now, this isn't on the slide, and it's not actually tested on, but there's a reason why you want to use the star all the time. I had, there was a prof that used to rant and refuse. He'd actually 
tell people, give take points away if they had anything with a select star. Most applications that talk to a database is what they call a multi-tier application. The database server runs on a server. The application server runs on its own server. Talk to each other across the network. And when you do a select star, it literally grabs the entirety of the record, regardless how big it is, and gives it back to you. Now, if you're only working with a small record coming out of a uh, lookup table that only has like two columns, yay, that's not going to do a lot of damage. On the other hand, if you're returning a row that has, say, 20, 30 odd columns, and there's some really big fields in there, like text fields with lots of text, like pulling up a Wikipedia article, for example, that's a big chunk of data per row. And let's say you return 10 rows, doesn't make sense. Return a million rows. Suddenly you go from returning 2K to returning 20 megabytes. Now, people say, well, 20 megabytes isn't that big. My phone takes pictures that big. Now, a picture, there's a bunch of things trying to get through a pipe that big. And you're trying to feed it something that big. What happens is everything's got to go through slowly one after another. It's a bit like you fill your sink at home and you pull the plug. The water doesn't disappear instantly, right? It gets funneled down a small... Same thing happens when the servers are on two different architectures. There's a slowdown between the two because there's a limitation. I mean, if you're working like on, on a cloud environment like Azure or uh, Amazon's web services, the pipe between the two is massive because they, they run, you know, 100 gigabit connection between the machines. But in most places, you know, the pipe's not that big. So you got to think about that. So when you just select the fields you want, you can go from pulling back 20 megabytes at a time to pulling back maybe 100K. 100K is a lot faster to pull back than 20 megabytes. So it's usually preferable to specify specifically what fields you want to pull back so you don't pull back more than you need to see. And also, when you do a select star, it may change the results of your query because you might be pulling back more than it needs. All right, after you've selected your fields, you have to tell it where you want the data to come from. This is known as the from, <coughs> excuse me, clause. There's three types of lists you can use. A single table, which is what I'm doing today. Joins, which will be covered either next week or the week after. That's why I say two lectures from now because depending how next week's lecture goes, it may get pushed on. And then there's derived tables which is definitely not going to be next week. Well, it might be next week if everything goes really, really well. Essentially, we're going to worry about single tables today, so a from test. From users, from customers, from orders. Essentially, we're going to grab values from a single table and return it. The next one is the conditionals, also known as the where clause. It's a series of Boolean expressions. There's lots of operators. You can have multiple clauses. It uses brackets. So if you don't understand what Boolean logic is, you're going to have a hard time. In other words, you've learned, have you learned, I'm assuming in Java class, you've covered ifs by now, I hope. Okay. It's if statements, essentially. I heard the word database, but it wasn't my voice. That's fine. Now, it's similar to an if statement. In other words, it makes this in a, in a program language, an if statement makes a decision. In SQL, it, you're creating what's called predicates, which is a series of expressions that filters the results down. So if you want a picture that's, and I'm assuming as kids, we've all played with a sieve of some sort. You know the little thing you shake sand through and you get the rocks, you go to the beach, you shake it and you end up with seashells or miscellaneous other dead things. You know, or you do it, you know, you do it to clean up the dirt you want to plant your garden so you get rid of all the weeds. And or if you've ever watched stupid shows like um, Gold Rush or those things when they're running the big wash plants, where they got a big grill and a small grill and a smaller grill until they get just, you know, the, the gold dust coming out the bottom. Same idea. Essentially you're setting up a bunch of filters that reduces the amount of data being returned until you have only what you want. 
again, this is important because if you just go select star from test and test has a million rows, it's going to return you all the columns times one million rows. Whereas you might only want three rows out of that. If you return all the rows, you're going to be writing application code, whatever language, Java, C Sharp, PHP, Python, whatever, to loop through all one million rows until you find what you want. Or you get the database server to do it for you, and it's going to do it a heck of a lot more efficiently than you ever will. And it's also going to do a heck of a lot more efficiently than any most general purpose languages will because that's its purpose in life is to filter data. And in a few moments, I'll show how you can help filter things down. I will be doing a demo with after I've done the slides. So we have the standard compares and operators. So we have less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, bang equals, the not equal, which is great because up till about eight years ago, we didn't have not equals. We had to write something else to achieve the same goal. Um, if you want to do an equality check, this is where Java trips you up because you're used to equal, equal in Java. Or if you're used to PHP, you got equal, equal, and equal, equal, equal. PHP's got the three equal operator also. In SQL, it's one equal sign. You put two equal signs, it's going to go your dum dum and give you an error. It's one equal sign. Not equal can be written two ways. Exclamation mark equals is not equal, but we used to have to use the diamond operator. Less than and greater than at the same time, because it's impossible for something to be less than and greater than at the same time. Thus, we had this. There are some database servers where the not equals does not work, just so you know. But it works in MySQL and Postgres. And I think Microsoft SQL Server just got it not long ago. I'm not sure if Oracle supports it or not. I don't remember it. Oracle's kind of behind for certain things. There is a few other operators other than equal and the usual ones you guys are used to seeing inside of Java. And these are, or you haven't seen in Java yet, apparently. It's a little scary, you eight weeks in. Um, the first operator is in. In is really cool. In is in a list. You needed a series of values, and if anything in there matches, it will return those values. So you can feed it a specific list of values. Or you can use between. Between is inclusive, just so you know. It means it includes the goalposts at each end. So if I say ID between 1 and 4, it'll return 1, 2, 3, and 4. Or any matches. If there's no 2, it won't return 2, but it'll check for 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's why it's inclusive. Not inclusive is a different kind of operation. There's one called is. And this one is cool because somewhere along the way, um, somebody realized that you cannot be equal to null. There's no such thing as being equal to null. Null is the fact that there isn't something there. So can anything ever be equal to the absence of value? It's impossible to, be, to check if something is equal to null because null is impossible to be equal to. That's the point of null. So somebody came around and said, oh, we'll create an operator just for nulls. And they also said, while we're at it, we'll make it work with Booleans also because it makes sense verbally. Is name, uh, n name is null. Checks if there's a, uh, the name is set to null. Or you can say, active is true. It makes sense. It's easy to read. Uh, by the way, you can't do equal to true. I don't know why, but you can't do equal to true. Well, maybe Postgres will, but I know MySQL won't. And then there's the other operator, which is the modification, not. You're giving it the negate. ID not in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Actually, no, sorry, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6. It'll give you everything but those. So it'll give you 3 and anything bigger than 6. So it says anything you don't find in this list. If you say ID not between 1 and 4, it'll return 0, 5, and up. And is not null means, well, it's not null. I guess there's no other way to explain is not null other than it's not null. Is not null. I'll be doing a, a demos of this after we're done. 
All right, pattern matching one. There used to be a pattern matching two, and I took the slide out about 15 minutes ago. Uh, why? Because most servers don't support that other f choice of wording, so I'm trying to teach generic. When you want to match a pattern, and this is where the SQL language starts getting powerful, is there's an operator called like. All database servers support like, the word like. In Postgres and Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, it is case sensitive. In MySQL, it's not because MySQL is special that way. It decides not to follow the rules everybody else is using. But assume that like is case sensitive, that it has to be an exact match to what's inside the string. To get around the case sensitivity, Postgres provides a special operator called I like. Insensitive like. You know, it's like that guy that's insensitive, but he likes you. Instead of like, just tell me you want to not match in a sensitive manner. I like in Postgres. There is a way that works on all other servers, and I will demonstrate it to you guys also. It has what's called wildcard characters. A wildcard character is a pattern match. Percent sign means match any any number of times. And I'll explain what those decisions that those decisions sounds are in a minute. Underscore says match once any character. So this literally matches only specific sets of strings. So if I say ABC like ABC, of course that's true because ABC is ABC. Again, if I said ABC like A percent, that's also true. It's saying, give me anything that starts with A. I don't care what's after the letter A, but the first character must be A. Everything else is gravy. Or if I say ABC like percent A percent, it's also going to be true because as long as the letter A appears anywhere inside that string from position 1, which, by the way, strings are 1 based in SQL, not 0 based. In Java, when you play with strings in Java, you have, they're 0 based. The first character is at 0. In SQL, it's at 1. So. Whenever you think about your string positions, plus one everything for yourself. If I go A, B, C, like, underscore B, underscore, that also matches. It's saying that's three characters long. B must be in the middle. I don't care what's on either side of B. And then if I go A, B, C, like C, it's going to false because A, B, C doesn't match C. Because C is not a pattern. It's literally just the string C. Yes. Well, no, it depends on what you're trying to match. When I go through some of the demos in a bit, I'll, sh I'll show you the behavior. But if depending, essentially, if you put A percent, it means it must start with If you do percent sign A percent, it means A anywhere from position 1 to the end. If you just do percent sign A, it must end in A. You can have multiple percent signs. You have multiple underscores. It's your choice. Um, then we have multiple and group conditionals. You guys have, again, if you've been learning if statements, like this would be a lot easier. When you try to make multiple, actually, I, I get to ruin your minds for if statements now. Usually it's the other way around where your minds are ruined for my SQL statements. If you're trying to make multiple clauses at once, in other words, you want to filter by more than one clause. Then you can use and, and, or, or. And the way it behaves is you take rule number one, you give it the conditional operator, rule number two, then it'll match it. And you can use brackets to control the processing order uh, because certain there's an order of operation, which is and or not, and is always processed before or which is always processed before not, just so you know. So and's always resolved first. Whenever you look at an expression, and will always be resolved first. Think of and the same thing as a multiplication or a division when you're doing basic math, and or as the addition or subtraction. So if you remember, you know, Bedmus, for those of you that aren't from around here, you know, brackets, exponents, Division, multiplication, addition, subtraction, right? Bedmus. This is the Canadian students. 
But that's the order of operations when you look at, when you resolve math, SQL is the exact same way, except it's brackets and or not. I'll be demonstrating that in a little bit. But if I look at ID and name greater is a name I like Dan. In other words, saying anybody whose name starts with Dan, capital D, in this case, it doesn't make a difference, I'm telling it to be insensitive, and the ID is greater than four, it'll return records that match that. The second one is ID greater than four and name I like Dan, or ID is equal to two. It's going to return anybody whose name, whose ID is greater than four, or it'll give you record number two. It, like I said, I'll be doing some demonstrations with this stuff in a bit, so it makes more sense. And then distinct. Distinct returns unique values. Um, and that's the, I'll, that'll be easier when I demonstrate in a bit for distinct. In other words, it looks at every column and only returns unique rows. So remember earlier I said if you do a select star, it may modify the results you're after. If you had three people with the first name Dan, and all you wanted to return was the name Dan, and you want to know if the name Dan appears in the database, you don't need to return three rows. You can say, give me the distinct first name. And then if Dan appears three times, it'll give you Dan once. Distinct gives you the uniqueness across the whole data set. And I'll show you guys that also in a moment. Oh, and there's the order by clause. Um, ordering is order by field. In other words, if you want to order by a person's last name, you go order by last name. Ascending or descending, so you go order by name descending, order by name ascending. Zero to nine, A to Z, capital A, capital Z. Descending will flip it the other way, capitals first, lowercase, and then nine to zero, reverse order. That's ascending and descending. If you're talking about dates, ascending means newest, old, newest, descending means newest to oldest. In other words, in, in reducing order of magnitude. You can sort by multiple fields by sticking fields by comma. It'll sort by, for example, this example, which is order by field one, comma, field two. It'll sort by field one, then it'll subsort by field two. It sorts the list completely one way, and then it does a second sort on the results. And then if you have another column, it'll subsort again. So every time you add it, it'll sort more and more and more based on which columns you've chosen. And I'm going to demo mode. Because this is so much easier when you see it than having here in the words. Okay, that's probably crooked. All right, so back to select star from, and I'm working on the ThinkCube database. So this is data you guys have access to as long as you have uh, SQL Manager installed and your server's running. So I'm gonna return star from customers. And I execute it. And of course I can't get this to get any bigger, which is annoying. But you'll see that it returns 10,101 rows. And it returns all the columns. And you'll see right here that the execution time is 31 milliseconds. Total time was 219 milliseconds. This means that the server figured out what you wanted in 31 milliseconds, and then it took another 180 milliseconds to transmit it to you. And that's running on the local machine without having to deal with the network. If I turn it around and go name and email, execution time was zero milliseconds because the results are already in memory, but it only took 31 milliseconds to give it back to you. There's the performance difference between select star and just select a couple of columns. It's, it's just better that way because that way you're not returning a lot. Again, I can return ID and name. And that's not gonna make a difference. Uh, 
And then, as you can see, I'm adding one. It added a millisecond by adding another column. I think, or is it just address? Address one. That I dropped for some unknown reason, making a liar to me. There's nothing quite like it. All right, I'm going to go back to name and email from customers. So, so far, it's fairly straightforward. The other choice I can have also is go, I'm going to put ID on here again, just so that you can see that it's doing what I asked it to do. So here's our IDs, 2 to 10,101, got name and an address. If I were to say, ID is equal to 5. It returns one row. Because I asked it for where ID is equal to 5. It's very precise. If I were to tell it to return where ID is 12,000, it's going to say empty set. Why? Because I don't have anything at 12,000. If your results don't match but the query is valid, it's still going to run. That means that if you're expecting results back and you're not getting it back, you need to check your query to make sure you actually wrote it correctly. That's just an important clue that it's, it's good to know. And now if I go ID is equal to 2 or ID is equal to ID equal to 5, that gives me two rows because ID is equal to 2 or it's equal to 5. Here's an example of more than one clause. You'll notice that on each side of the OR statement, it's a complete predicate. It's a complete logic test. I've often I'll see students go, oh, I want to know where ID is equal to 2 or equal to 5. You can't do that because this is not a complete predicate. A complete predicate is value, expression, value. This is nothing, expression, value. You must always tell it both sets. Even if you're operating on the same field, you still need to list it twice. You can't use a comma. Now, if you want more than two, depending on if you're trying to get three or four, then you'd use what I'm going to demonstrate in a moment, which is the in, the in clause, which will return the exact same thing. This allows you to do, you know, And that'll return this set. That's the in. Yes, you can keep or and or and or and or. Once you get past two on the same field, you're probably better off using an in list because it's going to be shorter. Now, this is the mistake people often make. Give me ID, name, and email from customers where ID is equal to 2 and ID is equal to 5, which will return nothing. People are saying, well, why would it return nothing? Everyone want to take a guess why it returns nothing. And, but why? Exactly. You can't, it can't be two things at the same time. ID 2 cannot be ID 5, and ID 5 cannot be ID 2. So if you're saying you're operating on the same field and you want to pull back multiple values, you have to use OR, where it's 2 OR, it's 5. If you say 2 and 5, you're being two things at once, and that's impossible. It's like saying the light is on and the light is off at the same time. It's not how it works. So th that sometimes that throws people for a loop a little bit, where somebody will ask, I want the information for customers 3, 4, and 5. Because in English, we'd write it 3, 4, and 5, but really what they mean is 3, 4, or 5. At least that's how the database wants to interpret it. I thought I'd highlight that because that's some mistake people make on a regular basis. So I've shown you guys how to use an equal sign. I've showed you how the or behaves. 
I'm showing you how the and behaves. So, it really throws me for a loop, though. So now I'm going to start playing with the the like operator. So name like. Remember earlier I said it's case sensitive, right? If I go name like Dan, it's not going to find anything. And that's because if we go back and take this off, just so I can show you guys. And here's a pro tip with this editor. If you highlight just part of what you want to run, you can just run that piece. So for those of you that are struggling, you can just pick a piece and run it. So if you look in here, this is because there's multiple names. And you know, there's nothing that's just one name. That's why that didn't work. Now, if I go like Dan percent sign, still nothing. It just so happens that nobody in there whose name starts with Dan, there's no Dans in the database. If I were to go say percent sign Dan like that, look at that, we find a bunch of people whose last name is Daniel. So that means give me where you find the name Dan, the letter is D-A-N, with that case. In other words, capital D, lowercase a, lowercase n. If I were to turn around and just put it lowercase d, now we're going to find a bunch of Jordans. Because the D is lowercase. Now, like I said earlier, I could go I like Dan. And then it'll give us everybody with Daniel and Jordan. It's a cute trick. Or if I want to make it cross-platform, because like I said earlier, I like is Postgres specific. So the database server we're running on our laptops right now, I like is specific to Postgres. None of the other servers have that. What they give you instead is, it's a function called lower. Do you guys learn about string functions yet in Java? Oh, thank God. Okay. You know, you got some various functions that you can do with strings. You can go lower, uppercase. You can trim it. This has the same thing, except you go lower bracket what you want, a lowercase. If I want to do an uppercase match, I go upper. So what this does is it will take the name column, force it to lowercase, and then do the comparison operator. Yes. That's exactly what I said earlier. Yes, like is case insensitive, but I like only works on Postgres. So if you go work on MySQL, uh, MySQL is a bad example because it's not case sensitive. Uh, you go work on Oracle, for example, did I like does not exist in Oracle land. You have to do it with the function lower. So whenever you do work and you hand it in, you can do it either way for this course. But if you want to program yourself to actually do it right when you hit servers other than Postgres, this is the one you want to use. There is no performance difference. Literally, I like does is doing this. It's just doing it with less words. So now I'm going to show you guys some of the pattern matching I was talking about earlier. So let's say I want to find, okay, well already we said we want to pull back everything that's Dan. But let's say we just want the people whose last names start with Dan. Now, when we look at the results, and I'm sorry it's really small, you'll notice first name, space, last name. I could say anything that's percent space Dan. So this will match. It doesn't care until it hits the first space it finds. And as long as the next set of letters is Dan, it's good. So if I run this, we're back to just the Daniels. Because uh, I'm still running. Spaces are not cased. There's no such thing as an uppercase space. Yeah, because I, I, I'm keeping it to lowercase. If I were to do this, so now make it case sensitive, it's not going to find anything. If I want to make it like this, then that'll work also. But I won't find anybody whose name, first name ends in Dan. And let's say I want to, I'm going to go back to being case insensitive for now. Let's say I want to find anybody whose name ends in Dan, like first name ends in Dan, like the Jordans. You could do this, which will give me a D-A-N space. That's a pattern. 
right? So anything, D-A-N, space, anything. The other pattern you might want to play with is the underscore. I don't have no idea if I got the matchup mix. There we go. So this is saying, give me anything until you see the letter D. I don't care what's next, but there can only be one letter next. And then N. So this could, this could be any letter of the alphabet, any character. Could be an exclamation mark, could be a dash, could be a, a, a letter, could be a number, could be anything. And then anything after that. So when I execute this, and that was a mistake, you'll, in, you'll see in here, Amandine Mounet, D-I-N. Um, what else do we have in here? Marie Denis, D-E-N. Um, not a lot of original, original names in here. Yeah, a bunch of Daniels in here. And a bunch of Dennis's in here. Oh, we got a Leonard Wing. D space N. It's case instead of it didn't care. So it'll give me anything that's D space N. I'm trying to find other ones that are in here a little out of the ordinary. Yeah, another Jordan. Jordan. Dennis Gauthier. Yeah, that covers the Bible, covers all the examples in here. But this, as you can see, it matches a bunch of different ways. Now, this is kind of handy when you're trying to pattern match on people's names. Or, you know, you're trying to find everybody who's last, you know, a specific last name. And you know for a fact it's a specific last name. Anybody whose last name ends in Jordan, which there isn't any. That was a bad example. I want to go ends in Daniel. That'll give me anybody whose last name is Daniel. And it must be at the end. <coughs> in other words, anything that ends with those. But I could say anything that ends in EL. We'll get more matches. Now we got Roussel and Morel. And Noel. It's pretty much the distribution I've got going in there. So that's that one there. But uh, sometimes when you want to play with this, oh, there's no phone numbers in this. So let's say you want to find anybody whose email address is, is .com. Now you can find anybody who's at .com or .co.uk or you know, .ca or whatever. You can also make sure that an email address is a proper email address by going anything at like this. So give me anything that has an at sign before dot. Technically, that's a valid email address. So anything that has an at sign before it reaches the first dot, it's good. And you could get it to check only the three letter. Do I have any letters? One, two, three. I could say anything that's in, you know, dot, three letters. And that used to be a valid way of checking for a valid email address. Then they created all these new domains that are a pain in the butt. You could all you just have to check for was dot com, dot, edu and the dot two letter codes for each country like dot uk dot cn dot ca ca that kind of stuff and now we got you know dot cloud dot me dot porn i wish i was kidding the dot you know virtual dot about me i've actually seen a dot about me the number of top level domains now is they, we used to have like one for each country plus like five now we're up to like hundreds they just keep throwing them out there because people think it's funny. Um, so that's basically the pattern matching. That's how you can use it to find stuff. You can also, if you had phone numbers, which I don't have in the database right now, I could go give me anybody who's in 613. 
Let's go 613 area code. So any phone number starts with 613. And if you wanted to go after anybody who was in a specific um, exchange, you could actually add the exchange in there, which is cool. So th that's how you'd match on phone numbers. Now, I've shown you guys how to match on strings. I've showed you how to match against IDs. I've shown you the in. I got to show you not, actually. So earlier I had ID in one, two, three, four, which gives me two, three, four. You'll notice why is that not a one? If you actually looked at the data in the database, you'll notice there's no one because I deleted it when I created the data set on purpose. Just saying. So one, two, three, four. Great. If I say not in. So a lot of people say, well, I want everything between one and four, but not including one and four. So that must mean not in. One, two, three, four. No, it means literally not in. Anything that's not one, two, three, four. And the same thing applies to the one that's called between. One and four. Well, give me two, three, four. It's the same thing as in one, two, three, four. But imagine you were trying to search against, you know, 500 rows. If you did 1, 2, 3, 4, it gets a little tedious. That'll give me the first 499 rows. Because there's no row 1. Just saying. But it's inclusive. A lot of people will say, well, how about if I, I want to include everything between them but not 1 and that? They'll go not. No, that gives you everything else but that. That's not how you approach that, ta that, te that particular question. However, if you're trying to find everything between them, but not including what I call the goalposts, those are the endpoints of the query, right? So 1 and 500, you have to go old school. Because when I went to school, back in the dark ages, we had to write it like this. Where ID is greater than or equal to 1, and ID is less than and equal or equal to 500. Some people actually find this easier to understand than between. And I go execute, and it returns the 499 rows. Eh? Because I deleted it. Because I wanted to. <laughs> I did it on purpose. Um, when, you do la uh, when you start doing some of the questions in the labs, you'll understand why. So, but if I want to do the, this is between. That's how we used to write between. And just to be safe, we usually used to stick it in brackets. So that this was operated on as a single clause. So this was treated as a single clause. Now let's say I want to have everything between 1 and 500, not including 1 and 500. You get rid of the equal signs. And I end up with 498 rows because 1 doesn't exist. And in this case, I'm saying anything less than 500, so it's, it, it will stop at 499 right there. Cute trick. And now here's another fallacy that people have. How many rows is this going to return? Zero. Why? Well, not just that. Yeah, they can't be, an ID can't be less than 1 and greater than 500 at the same time. It's impossible. It's like having said light is on and light is off at the same time. That's not how it works. They have to be careful with your ands. On the other hand, if I wanted to say or, that will give me everything on the outside, which is the same thing as not between. As you can see, there's more than one way to keep writing the same statements. It's when you start getting fancy where you start throwing in lots of brackets where mistakes start to happen because you can change the order of how things get retrieved. So I'm going to go back and fix this so that it's actually functional. Here's our happy between again. I'm going to show you guys the order by clause while I'm here since i got something that's easy to work with. 
I'm going to tell it to order by name. I'm going to go execute. And now you'll see that it's sorted alphabetically. Aaron. AA. -A. You have all the AAs and then it goes AD. AG. AL. From left to right, it'll sort alphabetically. Just like you'd sort a list normally. But that's what the computer's going to do too. It's going to sort it alphabetically for you. And I'm going to add in, I'm going to take away email. I'm going to put in city. Get rid of the ID. And you'll see right here, we're sorting by name and then by city. And if I look down here, for you, those of you that are actually running the same time as me, you'll see it better. Alexandre Lemoyne had, lives in Racine in Berlin. Right? So the same per name exists in two different cities. You'll notice that the R is before the B. If I were to tell it to sort by name and then by city, it goes down here, you'll see now that Berlin comes first. So it sorts by the first column. After that's sorted, it'll sort a second time the sub-results. And it'll sort that a third time for each column you add in. Um, and like I said, this will do the sorting way faster than any Java code you're going to write. That's its purpose in life. It's designed to do this. So it's going to do it really, really fast. Um, so that's the order by. Now, I'm going to take that off. And leave this, so if we have 499 rows, because I want to get rid of the last two clauses before I start showing different another set of where statements. I'm going to show you guys distinct. I'm going to hit execute. I still got 499 rows. And essentially, it's 499 rows because it, what it does is distinct looks at column number one, then column number two. This, each combined set has to be unique. So the whole row going across is unique. If I were to just go give me the unique names instead, now we have 497 rows instead of 499. Why? Because two people have the same name. Therefore, it's only giving me the distinct names, the unique values of each name. Regardless of how many times they're in the database, it, it finds only the unique values. That's what distinct does. So when you use distinct, it operates on the entire row, and then it only gives you the unique values. Um, often you'd use that with retrieving email addresses out of a database, for example. You're sending out a mailer, and one guy's email address is in the database three times. You don't want to send the message three times to him. You can get in trouble for that in Canada, by the way. There's a few laws against doing that. It's called spam laws. Um, you shouldn't send the same message to the same person twice inside a day. Really, you're not supposed to do that. Um, there's rules against that. <laughs> so, so distinct is good for just pulling out the unique value, so you're only pulling it out once. So now I'm going to go back and play with some more where clauses. Now I showed you how the order by works. Actually, I wanted to go back for a second. One more thing I wanted to do with the order by. Descending. It's going to sort, sort by last name first and then the city. So it'll be last name in order, then city. So last name Z to A. City will still be A to Z, Z, depending on how you choose to run your operators. Because this sort direction only affects the clause. It's a pair, right? So, And you'll notice that I haven't put anything with city because the default sort is ascending. 0 to 9, A to Z. And I'll leave that up there. People are scrib scribbling away. A? Try that again? Yeah, they're not, yeah, they're not equal. You want to see what not equal? All right. All right, so earlier I showed, actually, let's go equal to two because I know one doesn't exist. She just asked me to show the uh, not equals. Now, this is the not equals you guys are going to learn about in Java if you haven't learned it yet. 
So it's going to say, give me everybody who's not ID 2. Uh, this is the same thing. It's impossible for something to be greater than and less than at the same time. There's no such thing. Again, it's like saying light is on and light is off. Uh, no, no, not with the not equals. If you want to go what you're asking, what she just asked is, can I use the not equals with a pattern match? No. However, you could go... Let's make it completely sane. And I'll hit execute. And that'll give me everybody whose name is doesn't contain Dan. So I think that covers all the versions of dealing with the strings that she brought up to my attention. By the way, I'll be literally taking my log and shoving it on Brightspace. So you have a copy of everything I ran in here. It's all whatever this is, number of queries I've run so far. Lots. All right. So now I've shown you guys about pulling back pattern matches, exact string matches, pulling from a list. I'm going to get you to the, to the gross one. There's one that is horrible to work with. Dates. Dates suck. Um, as a programmer, you will discover how much you hate dates really, really fast. Now I'm going to pull back everything from orders. And you actually saw my laptop take a little break from reality there for a second. Uh, because they just returned 47,000 rows. It's kind of cool. Now, in here we have order dates. And if I go, and this is where you can discover how much dates suck. Dates, not so much. Timestamps. Let's be a little clearer. Dates are bad. Time is worse. Um, if ever the day you have to calculate three days from now, you'll understand how much it sucks. Especially if it happens to be that today's February 27th and there's a leap year. It's, it's bad. Um, so a lot of people say, well, let's, let's pick one here. Uh, November 2nd, 2016. So, this is what's called SQL or ANSI standard time format. Often you also see it, in my, they call it MySQL time because someone on reason, people I think MySQL is the only database server out there. And it goes in year, month, day, in descending order of magnitude. Postgres is very, very forgiving. As in, I could have typed this in as and that would have worked. But this would not work in MySQL. I don't know if it'll work in Oracle. It, did, it didn't when I went to school. They may have fixed that by now. It's been a few years. But it didn't back in the day. So I recommend if you're playing with dates, always use the standard time. So now I'm going to run this, and I'm going to get nothing, even though I actively picked that. I picked that, I picked that specific date. Let me go. Sh let's go, go look at the data again. And I used November second. Where the heck November second went in all this? I should have grabbed the first one, make it easier to find. Um, which this one's 10 26 2015. I'll change it to that so that it's again. It was the first row, but I can't find it when I'm running that specifically. Now, anybody want to take a guess why? Time. With the timestamp field, it also checks the time. When you type in a date like this, this is what it assumes the time to be. 
This also known as midnight. When we look back at the results over here, that's 4.47 a.m. If I actually want to match that specific time, I'd literally have to put in I still didn't match. Well, no, was it 2016? That's no, wrong. 2015. If I go back to this, yeah, it's 2015 because it was 20 seconds in. Yay! We're talking. I was off by 20 seconds in the query, and it won't match. That's what I mean. I talk about. Querying dates, it sucks. Um, there's a few ways of handling this. This is where your friend greater than or equal to comes from. And I'll give you guys a pro tip to make your life easier. Now, Postgres, even though here the time doesn't show, show the microseconds, Postgres is precise to the microsecond, which means that if you want, actually want to find the very last and in theory, it's actually precise enough to actually still not have a transaction happen outside of this. So if I run this, It'll give me everything that happened on that day. Great. Did you know there's a way easier way to write that? Less than the next day. Why? Because it always assumes midnight. And that should give me, in theory, the exact same number of rows. 77 rows. So when you want to talk about a range of dates, in other words, you want something to happen on a specific day, you have to say greater than or equal to the date. If you really want to be precise, you could also include the hours, the minutes, and seconds. And you say less than the next day. That's the easy way. You can also use between, the between operator. In theory, it should give you the same results. And some people like this better. And yeah. there we go. Again, 77 rows. Exact same thing I wrote. Just for some people, they'll find this easier to understand. Because it looks like an English sentence, right? Give me everything from orders, where are the order dates between this and that. By the way, if I do this, it'll give you nothing. Why? It's saying, give me everything with the order dates between midnight on the 26th and midnight on the 26th. Yeah. It, there's no way to, for the data to actually... In theory, you might have one record that went in right at dead midnight down to the microsecond, depending how you're getting it to track the dates. Um, this data set's actually converted from MySQL. That's why there's no microseconds, just so you know. Um, but there used to be, there's no microseconds. So so that's that's the basic dates. Now, again, I showed you guys how to handle um, the seconds and the not seconds. There is one other way of doing this, which is... Already I proved that this doesn't work. I just got to remember the order to do this in. Now, 77 rows again. This is called casting. It's a advanced technique, <laughs> let's call it. Not all database servers support this. So this is Postgres being clever. There, There's other functions, to date, to car, to the integer, to... You know, you can convert to other data types. This is called casting. You're saying, take this timestamp, and before you run it through the query, convert it to a date, which drops the number, the, 
the time part of the the time part. So actually, let me show you what it looks like. If I go order date, oops, order date, this, I think. It's hard to see, but here's the, the full. There's the date part. There's the time part. So in theory, and this is going to sound stupid, but I've actually had the sales manager where I work ask questions like this from our sales database. What is, what is the most common hour of the day that we do sales online? Yeah, they want to know, is it from 8 to 9, 9 to 10, 10 to 11? I'm like, who cares? Honestly, that's the point of selling stuff online. We can, they can buy it whenever they want. But apparently they decided it, 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 there was a direct correlation from when we sent out email blasts to 40,000 people as to how often the, the sales ticked up at what time of day afterwards. So the guy was trying to target messages that would get people to buy stuff. Sorry, I almost said the word shit. Let's buy stuff first thing in the morning. As soon as they come in, oh, look, there's a great sale. Let's buy it now. Click. Impulse buy. Um, so... That's, you know, you can actually at least extract the hours and the minutes. Um, there is one other piece of syntax, which I don't remember. I got to look it up. Because I don't use this very often. Yes. There we go. So I showed you guys how to pull out the date. I showed you guys how to pull out the hours. How about if I want to know... I want to know everything that happened at 10 a.m. I hope this works. There's every the order placed at 10 a.m. This is called date part. And it, like I said, I'll be posting all these so you guys can run them against your own ThinkCube database. So... This is, you know, the literally the date part, the hour. So I want, out of the timestamp, I just want you to give me the hours. So everything that happens at 10 a.m. It's a cute trick. Um, there is also... Or if you just want to know... So if Sunday is Sunday is zero, right? Yeah. How many sales do we have on Wednesday? Day of week, Wednesday is three. There, I'll put it in the comments so that when you look at the video, you know what it's doing. Um, now, this is an odd, all database servers have something equivalent to date part. That sometimes syntax is a little different. However, what a lot of people want to know is they want to get a result of the sales broken down by, you know, by days. So, you know, first day of the month, last day of the month, and how many orders in each. And because I can operate it on it down here, I could actually theoretically also include it up here, and you'll see that it shows day of the week three. Or if I just went day, you'll see that it's all, these are all the sales on the 2nd, the 16th, the 10th, the 10th, the 16th, the 4th. But these are all sales on a Wednesday. These are all the Wednesdays of that month of, of those days. Yeah, so it's operating day of the week, everything on Wednesdays, and then it tells me what the day was. So I could actually just get it to extract. I could go month, day, go. Right now, you know, November 2nd, September 16th, November 11th, and it matches over here. They're, they're cute tricks. Um... Which leads me to why do we have such functionality inside the, Java, the SQL language? And it's not just so that we can write fancy queries. 
There once was a time, we're going back here, way back. This was, almost, this was coming out of style when I went to school, where when we ran the query, the query was run, but it didn't go to a screen. It went to a printer. And what would happen is nightly these queries would be run. It would print out a report for the sales manager out of the database based on these kinds of queries. So the guy wouldn't want to have the whole timestamp. He just wants to know what happened yesterday broken down by days. When I show you guys aggregates next week, this kind of stuff will start making a lot more sense why you want to do this. But it used to be that you'd run a report, it was an SQL statement, and the output was redirected to the line printer. And it was like magic. Because it would just, magically you'd type in your command, hit run, and the printer would just start spewing stuff out. And it's not like a laser printer would just would woof and it becomes a piece of paper. Um, how many people here have ever heard of line printer? Not a dot matrix printer, a line printer. Well, line by line, but they're about that wide, and it's, yeah, okay. They're there. They pretty much that's what they were. The line printers didn't actually have. So you guys are used to think about a dot matrix printer, which is basically a set of needles I would punch against a ribbon. The line printers actually had the full set of letters built into the head, so it would strike the letters just like a typewriter. But it was able to print close to 500 characters a second which is faster than a dot matrix printer could do. And you hear it go, Barrr, and it sounds like a machine gun going off. Um, and the paper just fold through. So we ended up writing these nice looking reports in SQL, that output. And also part of what I'm going to show you guys next week is aliases, which allows you to rename stuff to make it look pretty. Um, but if I wanted to extract, let's say I want to know all the orders that happened yesterday, I could go order date. Oh, I don't remember the columns in this table. I've only been using this ThinkCube database for like four years, you know. I just don't remember it. So you got order notes. You got a customer ID and an order date. I could go so I'm going to extract just those two. Then I add on my where clause. Last quarter of the year. I got it right on the first try. So this will give me everything that's sold October, November, December, which is the last quarter of the year, well, the calendar year. And let's say at this point I want to know The year does not exist. Oops. My, that's my SQL. So it'll tell me everything in the last quarter of 2015. So you could write this. You could also write this. Come on. That'll give you the same result, I think. Yes. So just show you, there's two ways of writing it. Some people will find this easier than this. Some people will find this easier than this. It all depends on how your brain is wired. But they do the exact same thing. SQL is great. SQL sucks. 
Because there's almost for anything you want to do, there's not just one way to write it. Now, there's an advantage to this one. Like I said, when I do aggregates next week, I'll demonstrate what the advantage of doing this is over this. But I can give you guys the two-second preview, which is imagine you want to have summarize it by month. So you don't care about all the sales, right? which this is 5,000 rows being returned. Let's say you just want to know total sales for October, total sales for November, total sales for December. If you were to do it like this, then you'd be loading that up in your Java application, looping through all. Did you guys learn about loops yet? <sighs> okay. A loop is when you do the same thing more than once until a condition is met. There's your programming lesson for today. That's your second programming lesson for today. Um, but essentially, you'd load it up in Java, that entire list of records, and you'd repeat, go over it one by one by one, 5,670 times, and start adding things up, creating individual bins programmatically, or you get the database server to do it for you. Like This is fancy because this allows us to pull records out. This is cool. When it comes time to uh, the aggregates next week, you'll really see where the power of this comes in. And that is exactly where I want to stop for today.